Hello there. Welcome back to Intro to Cognitive Science. Today we are going to start from the start, more or less. Um, I mean, technically we can always roll all the way back to the dawn of uh, sentience or perhaps scientific thought, but uh, this is a good place to start with the behaviorist movement. Um, the suggested reading for this is chapter 1.1 of the Bermudez text. Um, we'll just help enlighten on some of these ideas. So, let's begin. Long ago, uh, the, the thing to note here is psychology, just like every science, kind of, it, it has its dawn. It begins, it starts to materialize as we start to think of the human mind not as just like this philosophical, interesting, mental construct, but as this observable, natural phenomenon. The mind works in certain ways, and we can ask questions about that. Um, and there were a lot of phases along the way before it spilled into a, a proper science. You know, the, the set of methods for a systematic investigation of these phenomena. So the first stop on our roadmap of the dawn of cognitive science is turning away from behaviorism. First, we'll talk about how behaviorism came about in the first place, and then how, how we turned away from that as a complete explanation. Um, later, we will get in later lectures, we'll get into more theory of computation and information, and also how we can start to view all of this through the idea of how information is processed in the mind. Um, but to start, we're going to talk about behaviorism. So, to understand behaviorism, which we'll define in a moment, don't worry, uh, let's start, though, with mentalism. William James, 1890. Um, psychology is the science of mental life both of its phenomena and their conditions. The phenomena are such things as we call feelings, desires, cognitions, reasonings, and the like. This is one of the first times that the, the field of psychology started to say, hey, we need to think about the moving parts of a mind and the, the currencies of a mind, feelings, desires, cognitions, reasonings. Um, and it's, it's a good beginning. This is a turn towards, hey, maybe, maybe the mind is something that we can actually study empirically. So how did the mentalist approach go about this? Um, so the goal in mentalism is to connect ideas of like the, how all of our thoughts and feelings connect to the specific conditions of the brain. You know, we, we had begun to see, hey, the brain has a lot of electrical activity going on. Uh, we knew that certain injuries to the brain changed how the mind worked, at least, you know. So this was the dawn of, of this kind of thinking. How do we, how do we connect that sort of mental life, the thoughts and feelings, with the brain? So clearly defining thoughts and feelings is key to this, and it's also a little bit difficult. Um, and unfortunately for, for the mentalists, uh, defining the conditions of the brain, we do that fairly well nowadays. I mean, you've seen the, the measurement techniques, all kinds of fMRI and CAT scans and all kinds of great stuff. Uh, they didn't have that in 1890. So... The mentalists used a lot of verbal reports and introspection. So discussing the, the contents of our own minds as things happen, discussing what's happening as I do a task, you know. And there are benefits to this, but what do you think are some problems with self-report and introspection? In science, we're really concerned with trying to get objective measures, or at least as objective as we possibly can. And the issue with self-report and introspection is that they're slippery. 
Um, you know, you, you might give a different answer day to day. Your, your mental state defines your ability to report on your mental state, right? Um, so it, it, make, it made for a difficult science. It was a tough route towards trying to make a science out of the study of the mind. So thoughts and desires are, they're really hard to quantify, just it, it's, tr it's hard to draw barriers between these things. Um, like I said, men introspection is a mental process, difficult to use a mental process, to study a mental process, right? Um, and verbal reports can just be inaccurate. A lot of times we don't actually know the answer to a question, but we'll still verbalize something anyway, right? Uh, so behaviorism emerged as an answer to, hey, well, shoot, how do we make a science out of the study of the mind? So behaviorism enters, and on kind of two parallel approaches around the same time, um, the conscious aspect of behavior is undoubtedly most interesting, but we are unable to deal directly with this by the methods of observation and experiment, right? We didn't have the tools for understanding the direct contents of the mind. We still arguably don't, really, not fully, but we have a lot better tools now. Uh, our methods have yet evolved further. But um, th So the idea is that we can't totally access the, the objective measurement of the mind yet. Uh, and then the ideal... Of, of this science of scientific men is to explain behavior in terms of matter and energy so that the introduction of psychic implications is considered superfluous. Okay, so what is he getting at? This is the idea that we can't really directly access the mind, so we need to stop talking about all of human behavior in terms of the contents of the mind. In fact, we have available to us behavior. I can influence behavior. I can change behavior. I can add things and subtract things from behavior. And perhaps that is the best way that we can start to understand whatever's going on between input and output of behavior. The mind's in there and it's possible to ask a lot of questions about it by focusing only on the inputs and outputs. So, again, this came in kind of two flavors, uh, the philosophical and the psychological flavors around the 20s and 30s. Um, and uh, you don't really need to know all the names, but Hempel and Carnap were logical positivists, and that, that was the beginning of the philosophical behaviorism. And the psychological movement was more run by... Watson, Skinner, and Pavlov. Some of these names, Skinner and Pavlov in particular, you'll see quite a lot uh, the more you deal with psychological history. So uh, the similarities between these two camps, both of them say, hey, let's get an account of human and even non-human behavior without talking about the mind. We can't observe the mind in its specific states, uh, but we can observe behavior. So let's focus on that. Um, so, you know, it, it's a methodological concern. It's too difficult to verify all the claims from the mentalist era about internal psychological states. And, I mean, critically, all scientific pursuits need to be falsifiable. They need to be able to be proven correct or incorrect. Now, you the nuances of that evolve with time, but... The basics are, I need to be able to make a claim that's testable. If it's not testable, then it's not really a useful claim, right? So these, these camps, this, the psychological and philosophical camps agree on this. Um, they do have differences, though. Um, so the, the philosophical camps focused a lot on language. How do we understand uh, the, the ways that we produce the behaviors of language, the, the mouth operations that are somehow also symbolic this this interesting meaning you know i'm speaking to you right now uh and we are able to use language despite not fully understanding how it works in the mind philosophy focused on this side whereas the psychology movements began to focus on 
other kinds of behavior, non-symbolic types of behavior. So um, what, what kinds of activity we engage in naturally and how that activity can change based on different kinds of conditioning. So um, the, uh, one of the primary modes, methods of, of uh, behaviorism is in conditioning theory. And there's two different flavors. We'll talk about both. Um, first, we'll talk about classical conditioning, uh, also known as Pavlovian conditioning. Uh, in conditioning, association is the key. So some stimulus can become associated with some response, written S, arrow, R. Um, and some of these are inborn, right? Infants will automatically search for a nipple. This is not something that they have to learn. If they had to learn it, they would probably die pretty quick, honestly. Uh, they, need, they need some of these things baked in. But we can also adapt new associations as we go, right? So your basic reflexes are, are automatic. So like the nipple seeking, uh, that's an unconditioned uh, response, right? But there are tons that we also learn, so conditioned responses. So let's look at how classical conditioning works. You'll have an unconditioned stimulus, right? Food, for example, that will cause an unconditioned response, salivation. Hey, food's coming, yum yum, I'm, I'm ready to eat. Then when you present a new conditioned stimulus just before the unconditioned stimulus, you start to form a new association. So if I ring a bell every time I serve you dinner, the bell starts to get connected with the response of the conditioned stimulus. So the food that, you, that you're used to seeing along with the bell they kind of go hand in hand now, and the bell makes you salivate just like the food. This is a new conditioned reflex. It is reinforced as you keep doing, you keep repeatedly exposing to this phenomenon. And if you ever stop, it will gradually extinguish, but there's some mitigating factors there. So let's look at this again. Um, the mechanisms of classical conditioning. So an unconditioned stimulus paired it is automatically paired with an unconditioned response. I get food, I salivate. I see food, I smell good food, I get real hungry, right? If I always have another stimulus paired with that food, specifically just a little bit before, um, for, for interesting mechanical reasons, um, we build up a new conditioned response. We adapt a new behavior based on the world. Now you'll notice this is all theorizing about some of the mechanisms of how behavior can change without talking about mind. We're not saying what the what I believe about the food or what I desire from the bell. We're just saying if I pair a bell with food, the bell can produce salivation. So Let's look at, uh, I will let Pavlov himself talk a little bit about, a little bit about this. Not actual Pavlov, it's, a, it's an actor with a terrible, uh, uh, what's the word, terrible accent, but we'll, we'll see. So um, I'm going to mute a moment and we'll, I will watch a little video on Pavlov's dogs. Pavlov's aim was to discover what caused saliva to flow. He rerouted the saliva ducts to the outside of his dog's cheek so that he could collect and measure the spittle. Perhaps, he thought, the production of saliva might be the result of a fixed nervous reflex, like a knee jerk. Mm. After taking many measurements of spittle, he confirmed that the dogs drooled automatically when their tongues touched food. He called the response the salivation reflex. Four, 
But his work started to run into trouble. As his dogs became familiar with the experimental routine, they started to fill their cheek tubes before Pavlov had a chance to stimulate their tongues. The dogs were learning to anticipate food. Pavlov tried a new technique. He erected screens so that the dogs couldn't see what was going on. Before passing meat through the hatch, he introduced a stimulus that was totally unrelated to feeding. A ticking metronome. At first, the dog dripped saliva into its cheek tube only when the food appeared. But after a number of trials, the dog began to connect the ticking with the arrival of meat. Soon, the sound alone made the dog drool. Eventually, the dog salivated as much to the ticking itself as it did originally to the presentation of food. Palmer, it is you that. Hmm? What did I say? He called this new response the conditioned reflex. Whatever the stimulus, his dogs could soon be conditioned to produce saliva. Pavlov believed that he had discovered how animals learned, even in the wild. So, you know, here, Pavlov was not officially a psychologist. He was interested in salvation, right? He was more on the biology side of things. This is famous. This is a this is a very early step to say, whoa, we can use exclusively behavioral methods to learn some stuff about what we would typically think of as mental processes like learning. The dog had learned something and we had uncovered a sort of a m mathematical behavioral relationship between the, the pre and post conditions of that learning. Um, so I hope this makes sense that th this classical conditioning is pairing stimuli to create new associations, right? Um, a couple of interesting side notes on how some of this works. Uh, classical conditioning, these kinds of, of pairings work not just for positive stimuli, but for negative ones. So you could make a bell cause nausea, uh, for example, if you've been pairing it with a like, very stinky substance or something, right? Uh, and same for pain. Uh, dogs could ap associate pinpricks with food, not just smell, no, or uh, not, sorry, smell. Sound is the typical thing for, for the dogs. But uh, the idea is any stimulus, so physical touch, uh, vision from light, sounds, any stimulus works um, with, with this kind of uh, conditioning, this new association pairing. Um, also, to, to an interesting extent, eventually the dogs stopped caring about the pinpricks because they knew it meant food, uh, which is exciting, sort of a backwards association kind of looping in on itself, right? Dogs are like, oh, pinprick, great, time to eat. So, yeah, so this is classical conditioning. The idea being that we can form new associations from, from nothing, from only our base associations that we have kind of automatically built in. You might be able to see, if you look at the very long picture of this, how you might build up a lot of very complex understandings of the world based only on these kinds of pairings, right? I build one kind of association, I start to associate that with a new set of setting, I start to associate that with a new setting, you know. So this was thought to be a very powerful idea that could scale up indefinitely. Um, on a side, a, a sort of a parallel but very much related track, 
uh, we can talk about operant conditioning, or also known as instrumental conditioning. Um, so if classical conditioning was pairing a new stimulus with a desired response, operant conditioning was about pairing sort of a natural behavior with a positive or negative stimulus to shape a new behavior. So we'll, as we'll see momentarily, when a bird presses a lever, give it a food pellet, and we can start having the bird press the lever more and more often, perhaps in particular patterns. So uh, here is a classic Skinner box. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about this. So uh, Skinner, Skinner is the, the scientist who, who's most associated with uh, operant conditioning. And this is a Skinner box. It has lots of stimuli options. It's got a speaker. It's got signal lights. Um, it has... Uh, food that it can it can dispense to to this little rat. Of course, there's a rat in here. Uh, there's also unfortunately an electrical grid to give little shocks. Um, typically, these experiments were not designed to harm the rat. It was to give a just a negative spritz. Right. I won't make full uh, full excuses. You know, it's still a bit cruel to do this to a rat, but. In laboratories, typically rats are well fed, they're well cared for, because you don't want a pained and stressed out rat in your, in your lab. So eh, it's a mixed bag, you know, there's cruelty, there's kindness, and there's science. Uh, here we are. So the idea of this, these little setups, though, is that there is a way for the rat to behave that is measurable. There's a lever that the rat can press on. Um, and there's lots of ways that the, the experimenter can interface with the rat, you know, in these very explicit ways, adding sounds or lights or pain responses or food. So lots of ways to play with this idea and start to ask, how the heck does this work? Uh, on the output end, we can also see how these kinds of, of experiments lead to a more complex behavior uh, in the terms of shaping. So I'm going to let Skinner, this time actually Skinner, uh, discuss this with us. Uh, he, is, he has pigeons, and he is going to show us how he shapes their behavior. And we're going to try another pigeon now, and uh, I will try to pick out some particular pattern of behavior and uh, make it uh, more f a more frequent part of the repertoire of the bird. Okay. Right, fine. This bird is, uh, has been uh, already conditioned to eat when the, when the magazine sounds and the light flashes. Now we'll just watch its behavior a bit. It's not doing anything in particular, you see. But I'm going to try to get it to do something. Suppose I shape up the behavior of making a complete turn. What I do is simply as I did then, to wait for some part of that uh, behavior. There's more of it, you see. Well, you, you can see that the effect is instantaneous. I'm waiting for it to turn counterclockwise now. And then I reinforce that movement. And I wait for a more pronounced movement than that. It's got to be more than that. There we go, all the way around. So, this little bird is set down. He knows to eat from this dispenser. And what Skinner is doing is waiting for the bird to engage in just a sort of a natural behavior. I'm turning and moving around, right? Uh, and then when the bird performs an action that they're trying, that we're trying to shape here, I turn left a bit, uh, you get rewarded. Continue doing that only for more and more pronounced versions of this, of this turning behavior until you get the bird turning in a circle. Reward, turn in a circle. Reward, turn in a circle. Reward, and so on. To build up what is ostensibly a lot more complex and, in a way, unnatural behavior. The bird's not just going to spin on its own, typically. Um, but it learns, oh, this is a, this is a good thing. I'm, I'm learning how to do this thing, and I'm getting rewarded for it. So, 
this is this is also powerful that you can see maybe how you could start to build very complex routines out of these kinds of these kinds of shaping these, this operant conditioning okay so these are both kinds of association right we've got shaping more complex behavior and basic pairings of of simple uh, stimulus response pairs uh, so it's important to know, like, like I mentioned a little bit before, associations aren't permanent. They do extinguish when the rewards go away, right? So you do gradually kind of return to a natural state, unless you are practicing or continuously experiencing these kinds of reward systems. So you can make these associations harder to extinguish by giving rewards either infrequently, so that's known as an intermittent reward schedule, or randomly, uh, random reward schedule, um, or both at the same time, right? Uh, so if you give rewards infrequently and at random, you can still build up an association, but it makes it harder for the for the behavior to extinguish, right? Uh, if you think about maybe gambling, how that works, right? So. For example, that a bird will press the lever much longer without a reward after you stop giving out these treats if they've been trained with an intermittent random or both intermittent and random schedule. Okay, so that's two kinds of, of association training, conditioning. Uh, what was the goal here? What were the behaviorists doing here? They were taking this stance that... We want to try to explain all behavior in terms of these conditioned responses. Uh, because, you know, it's a mechanism. It's a mechanism for understanding, oh, this is a way that behavior changes based exclusively on things that are observable, right? Uh, they even said things like, hey, language could just be a very complex, intricate network of these conditioned responses, right? Words... Uh, might just be produced in response to other objects and situations or other words, right? Sentences are chains of words that pr are produced in response to each other. All of what I'm saying to a behaviorist could just be a chain reaction of a buildup of associations that I have. Doesn't hold up perfectly anymore, but it was a good place to at least start investigating from. Um, so... Continuing on this goal, uh, they want to account for psychological phenomena, these, these sort of mysterious things that have been tough to pin down and can't be observed easily. Um, they, they want to account for this by way of looking at just inputs and outputs of behavior. So for them, attention is not this, this special act of some internal mental focus. It's just a fact. Uh, organisms exhibit attention when they look at a stimulus and there are many other stimuli right they're not going to make any claim about how i move internal attention around in my mind they're only making a claim about what is the organism attending to currently attention for them is descriptive whereas attention for for a more internal focused science would be more theoretical so there are some problems here. You may have thought of some of them on your own, but um, they are... There's several roadblocks that appear uh, after a few decades of, of behaviorist research. And good stuff. I want to make clear, the idea is not to, to crap on behaviorism, right? We, we are talking about the emergence of a science for the observable, right? Uh, we have developed more observable tools as we've moved forward and better ways to build theories and, and all these great things that make behaviorism a little bit uh, obsolete. But at the time, it was a good approach. And there's even things that we should keep in mind going forward. You know, we can't stick entirely to the mental process models, we need to still have everything grounded in behavior to some extent. But that's an aside. Let's talk about the problems that arise for behaviorism. 
So, there's a few. There's a few landmark uh, experiments that present these things that behaviorism couldn't really explain as just complex chains of associations. Uh, in particular, there's a, there's a few. So, first is that observations... Uh, learning can take place without any kind of reinforcement. So I can pick up information from my environment without having a reason to, without being explicitly rewarded for that. Uh, also, there are, were observations that information doesn't need to be connected to the body, right? One of the implicit assumptions of behaviorism is that it's all based on my own inputs and outputs. Something has to happen to me, either food or, or you know, light or whatever, uh, to make it have any meaning for me at all, right? And finally, there's objections for um, how do we even account for language? The, the, the initial thought on how behaviorism could account for language just doesn't really pan out. So let's talk about place learning. That's the first hurdle. So, rat moving through a maze, right? Uh, a behaviorist claim might be that this, this is a chained sequence of conditioned reflexes, right? I start in the maze, I turn right, I turn left, I hit a dead end. There is no reward happening, I'm not learning anything interesting. But the more times I run the maze, I eventually get to the end, I build up these useful associations like, ooh, right, then left, then right, then left. That ends up at food, right? So the theory for behaviorists is that I can just chain backwards all these conditioned reflexes to my experience in the maze. Now, the alternative, the idea of an interesting internal mental life is that maybe I'm actually learning the spatial shape of the maze. Maybe it has very little to do with the moment I get rewarded, all of my behaviors recently have been, have been shaped, but maybe it's more, well, no, I know this maze and now I know how to get to the food within the maze. Sort of an internal learning without an exposed behavior. So here is an experiment. In this experiment, there were three groups of rats running the maze. Typical experiment like this is you, you release the rat at a specific start point and you let them go through the maze. There's a lot of like one-way doors and hidden curtains and things like that, whatever. It's, it's a complex space that they have to learn to understand, right? Um, well, we, we assume from a cognitive angle they learn to understand it, uh, but there is still the behaviorist approach. So group A, they are released into the maze, and when they get to the end, they are rewarded with food. This is the classic thing. This is, you know, oh, I, they learn to quickly turn right, then left, then right, then etc. Uh, I don't know the exact solution to this maze. I never solved it myself. But the idea being, they learn the path, right? And that is still comfortably in the behaviorist lingo, right? I just learned a chain of actions that get me to food, right? Group B is what we typically call a control group. Uh, they were unrewarded. They were just turned loose in a maze and uh, never rewarded with food for their efforts. Kind of a bummer. These rats didn't learn the maze. They didn't learn a path to the food box because they had no reason to. They, they just kind of wandered around the maze and waited to be picked up and put, you know, hey, back in their cage where actual food is. Great. Uh, so group A and group B, of course, differed greatly in how the rats behave in the maze. Now here's the trick, the thing that's tough to explain. Group C, you release the rats into the maze and for 10 days, you let them just, they, they are not rewarded with food. You let them just wander around the maze, right? For those 10 days, they're exactly the same as group B. They're not learning anything about food, they're not behaving in a particular way that would lead them to food, like, of course not, right? Then we reward them. You start giving them rewards in the food box after 10 days. And what happens? 
their learning speeds up dramatically. It wasn't that they, they were picking up some kind of information that they're now exploiting. They now have adapted. Oh, shoot. Hey, I know this maze and I know where the food is in this maze. Like, great. I'm going to turn right, right, left. Right. So the the idea here is that behaviorism can't really explain that. Behaviorism suggests that there needs to be some kind of external stimulus rewarding and causing an association to create the behavior, the complex behavior, the shaped path, right? But these rats were hanging on to something. They learned the place. They learned where they were. They held some kind of internal understanding of the maze's shape that they immediately started exploiting when they learned that, hey, food is available somewhere in this maze. Now, in a similar vein, uh, so here's another experiment. In this experiment, we had two rats who were set at either they would start from the south or start from the north. And the food was always at the east, right? Uh, they clearly that this is a very, very simple, not even a maze of, of, of any kind. It's just like a turn, right? So, okay. The assumption in behaviorism is that I learn a very specific action, right? I learn turn right or I learn turn left, right? So in this case, if I trained a rat to start from the north, and that means it's always going to turn left to get to food, if I started at the south, it should get confused, right? It should run off the wrong direction. That's not what happened. Rats could pick up on enough cues to figure out where they were, and they knew where the food was. It doesn't matter where they were trained. They didn't learn the exact chain of actions that turned them towards food. They learned how this place is laid out. So these two things that together mark a sort of a, a turning point where people start to say, okay, well, cool. We have ways of observing behavior with interesting rules that we'll someday have to explain, but we're starting to see things that these, these behaviorist approaches cannot explain. Um, further, uh, we can talk about hierarchical processing, specifically language, but others, others as well. So, um, behaviorism's claim is that everything's stimulus response chains, right? But we do a lot of stuff that is both bottom up and top down. Now, what do I mean by that? The idea that we take information from our sensors and, and make a lot of decisions based on what's happening in our environment, but we also make a lot of decisions and actions based on what we are, our goals are, right? I have top down goals to go to the grocery store and I have bottom up goals to recover from tripping over that little chunk of the sidewalk. Uh, you know, and hope I don't look too goofy. So the idea is that these systems are communicating up and down. It's not a one directional response chain. There's all kinds of stuff going on that helps you achieve all this, moving both upward towards the mental place and downward towards the, the you know, your, your fingers and toes, right? So tasks require a lot of planning and prediction and goals and serial order could not really explain a lot of these more complex things. Um, so we have some evidence here for this. Movement can occur even when sensory feedback is interrupted, right? Even if I, if I shut your eyes, if I put a blindfold on you halfway through a room, you're going to still be able to walk. You might eventually bump into the wall, but something in your system does not need the external stimulus of the shape of the room. You've hung on to that, right? You, you know that the floor is not going to suddenly change elevation. And also there's this piece of the puzzle that is a lot of your behaviors, at least at the muscle, muscle level, uh, they're far too fast. They don't make it all the way back to central processing, right? Uh, my fingertips move, you know, some of those movements are within a hundred milliseconds. It would take me quite a lot longer 
than 100 milliseconds to process and then deliver corrections, right? So how, how this leads into how we would explain errors. If I'm, again, if I trip over a chunk of the sidewalk and I recover, I'm doing that a lot faster than my actual upper level cognition is capable of. So there's a lot of evidence here. There's a lot of ideas here that are starting to come out, starting to get studied in their own right, that are showing, hey, this doesn't, this doesn't really follow from a simple chain. We can also talk about context, right? So a simple chain reaction. How would you produce and comprehend this sentence? The mill right on my right thinks it right that some conventional right should symbolize the right of every man to write as he pleases. I mean, it's a little bit convoluted, but the, those are all different uses of the word, the sound, right, right? And that's strange. How the heck would I make sense of that in a strict stimulus response pattern? I can show you the words, that helps, but the context helps you too. A mill right, hmm, somebody who works at a mill, all right. On my right, on my right, okay, that's a, that's a grouped chunk of information. And we're seeing this hierarchy. We, we split language up into these sections. It's not just a linear chain, it is, percolating up the ideas. Oh, uh, so the next one is thinks it, it, is, it is right, morally right, just, correct, whatever. Uh, a conventional right. Oh, so some sort of ritual, whatever. So these are all ideas that lead us away from just being able to say, ah, it's a, it's a long, complex chain of, of these, these associations moving forward. Even just back to the idea of like a basic motor plan. How do you execute a basic thing like reach out and grab the pen? Well, you have some top level goal that gives you motivation, right? Oh, I need a pen, right? You're going to select what part of your body you're going to move to get that pen. You're going to determine the trajectory that effector needs to take. So you're going to coordinate all your muscles down to the fine tuned sensory feedback of, I mean, I can show you a law, Fitz law predicts that you're not gonna touch the pen directly on your first try. You're gonna correct really quickly. And at a, again, at a level that's below where we would typically think of you being able to notice it and respond to it. You're doing something else. There's a more complex picture. So, this gets us to a place where we can say, huh, there's a lot going on that behaviorism can't quite tap into. Behaviorism has given us many great things, but it's also falling short here at the turn towards a more internal understanding. So big picture, some, some takeaways, some thoughts. Uh, latent learning is important. We can pick up and store information right? Just, just by being in a space, we understand the world around us. We construct a more complex understanding of the relationships in the world, right? Whether that's just the physicality of it, or maybe the ways that certain things move, or how water works in, in our, our location, right? Uh, but we can also engage in place learning. Uh, so we can learn about our environment, not just our, our own, you know, actions and reactions and interactions. And language uh, is the most basic form of, of this idea. Uh, well, basic is, that's being a little light. Uh, language is hierarchically organized. It's not just a serial thing. Despite the fact that I'm giving you words in a serial order, there's concepts within concepts, right? These are not simple chains that trigger one another. So cognitive science grows from a couple of these basic ideas that we, we pick up and process information from the environment in a way, in, in an internalized way, and that that information is organized and connected and, and related not just to do with our direct behavioral inputs and outputs. So 
we will continue uh, with some of these ideas in the next lectures where we start to talk about theories of both information and computation. Kind of a parallel advancement in the computing world, or perhaps even the birth of computing, that draws some parallels and sets more stage for, for us to make a better science. So more on all that next time. Uh, now, as, as always, here is a final thought. What is a tool, game, or app that you use that might be using stimulus response pairings to try to shape your behavior? All right, thanks, take care.